Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. To get us started um, this evening, we will be um, sharing some videos. And to get us started as a little practice run, we're going to share an ESP video that's available um, to you all. You can download it um, by visiting www.nea.org uh, forward slash ESP. Great job, Sophie. Thanks, Mom. There's an awesome team helping me at my school, and they include education support professionals. Like, whenever I'm on the bus, Mr. Davis encourages me to read. Officer Rodriguez cares about me. He keeps me safe. Mrs. Jackson is our office superhero. No matter how busy she is, she's always there to help. If anything breaks, there's nothing Mr. Wong can't fix. And Nurse Stevenson makes sure everyone is healthy. Math used to be hard for me, but now with Mr. Rushi's help, it's my favorite class. Ms. Jones feeds us hot and healthy meals so we have energy to learn. The school is spotless thanks to Mr. Decker, and he also helps me with my three pointers. Swish! Mr. Lee fixes the computers at our school, but also takes time to help students in need. Wow, it really takes a village to educate students. Yep. And since they help us from preschool through college, I can count on them for years to come. Education support professionals live in the communities where they work. They meet the needs of the whole student by keeping them healthy, safe, supported, engaged, and challenged. Learn more at nea.org slash ESP. Throughout this webinar, um, some of the things that we're going to um, cover, we will discuss how children come to understand and adjust to a loss. We will offer practical suggestions on how education support professionals can create a school climate where children are able to talk about their loss and receive needed support. And we will um, go over many resources that are free. Um, they're developed by the coalition to support grieving students, um, of which NEA is a, a, an original uh, founding member. And uh, all of these resources will be highlighted throughout the webinar. At this time, I would like to um, welcome our um, esteemed guest, Dr. David Seanfield. Dr. Seanfield, MD, FF, FAAP, is a developmental behavior pediatrician and director of the National Center of School Crisis and Bereavement, located at the University of Southern California School of Social Work. He is a professor of the practice in the Susan Dvork Tech School of Social Work and Pediatrics at the University of Southern California and Children's Hospital, Los Angeles. He is a member of the American Academy of Pediatrics Disaster Preparedness Advisory Council and has served as a commissioner for both the National Commission on Children and Disasters and the Sandy Hook Advisory Commission in Connecticut. Dr. Seanfield has authored over 100 scholarly articles, books, chapters, um, and um, has provided over 850 presentations on the topics of pediatric bereavement and crisis. He has provided consultation and training on school crisis and pediatric bereavement in the aftermath of a number of school crisis events and disasters within the United States and abroad. It is with great pleasure that I welcome with us this evening Dr. David Seanfield. All right. Well, it's a welcome um, to everyone who joined the call. Uh, what I'm planning on covering today is really the role that education support professionals can play to support grieving students through efforts to create a supportive school climate. And I'm going to highlight in particular a resource for free professional development um, in this area as well as technical support through the Coalition to Support Grieving Students. And I want to um, emphasize that NEA is a founding organizational member of this coalition and we appreciated their uh, participation and support. So I'm going to start uh, first, um, if you can help me advance the slides. Um, it, there was a recent survey done of educators back in about 2012, and they surveyed over 1,200 uh, members, and they found that 92% of these educators reported that grief is a serious problem that they recognize deserves more attention in schools. And the teachers reported that they wanted to provide support and assistance to their students who were grieving, 
but the most important barrier preventing them from providing that support was what they perceived to be insufficient training um, and or professional development. In fact, only 93% of classroom teachers um, had ever received any training in bereavement, and only 3% of the members uh, reported that their schools or districts currently offered that training. Any education on this important topic, although they recognized that it was an important topic, that they had grieving students in their classes, um, but again, only 3% of the schools or districts offered any such training, and only 7% of them had ever received any information or training throughout their careers. Um, and we would expect that the rates are even lower if you're talking about uh, education, educational support professionals. And so it's really, it's one of the major limitations that keeps um, concerned and competent adults from reaching out and helping grieving students in their midst. And a lot of this is very relevant for um, ESP, educational support professionals, um, in their roles within schools, particularly as they impact the educational uh, environment and climate. So I, I remember I was um, responding to a school shooting that had occurred, and um, there were a number of students who had died in this uh, shooting. And I was uh, talking with um, a food service professional, and they told me that they noticed that the girls in the school, these were high school students, were wearing long sleeve shirts. And I asked them why they thought that was relevant, and they told me that as the girls approached the, um, the as they approached the, the workers there on the on the lunch line, that they would hold out their trays, and then they would notice that their sleeves uh, would retract, and they could see that the children had been cutting themselves more. And they knew that that was something that was probably related to the trauma that they had experienced, but they also did not think that anyone else in the school had observed it. I also remember talking to another food service professional, and she had observed that a child was going through the trash um, in the cafeteria. And when she inquired a little bit more, she found out that actually the child was looking for food for his family. So the issue is I, I, a lot of support professionals observe things that others don't. Getting back to that same school where there had been a school shooting, um, one of the custodians told me that he was concerned that the students seemed to be out of control. And when I asked him to describe what he meant by out of control, they said, he said that, um, that the, he went into the cafeteria one day and he saw a group of students, these were high school students, and they had gotten up from their seat and they left the tray um, that they had been using. And so he kind of reminded them to please bust their trays, and they continued to walk away. So he stopped them and he said, you know what, if you don't, if you don't pick it up, no one else is going to pick it up. So at that point, the kids uh, turned back around, they picked up their trays, uh, they went to the door of the cafeteria and they threw them out of the building and said, are you happy now? They're not on the table anymore. And the custodian looked at me and said, you know, this is, these are good kids. They would never have done this before the shooting had occurred. He said, you know, uh, the concern that I have is that not only are they out of control, but they would never do this in front of the principal, in front of the teachers, or in front of their parents. And he just looked at me and said, we see a different side of these students, and we know when they're really in distress, and we don't think that others see that. I also talked to one of the transportation service professionals in another school after there had been um, a shooting that had occurred there. And they told me that you know, they didn't really initially see how they could provide this um, type of bereavement support. <laughs> and then one of the drivers uh, of the bus said, well, you know, the other day I dropped off a group of kids at the school, and I asked one of the students to stay back for a couple minutes. And I turned to him and said, you know, I understand I, that your brother had died recently. I want you to go inside and talk to a counselor right away. This isn't something that you should try and deal with on your own. So the point is that a lot of times, um, educational support professionals, just in the role they play in supporting a positive school climate, can do a lot to support these kids, even if it doesn't seem like it's something that you would anticipate would be formally part of your position. So one of the reasons this becomes important is not only the impact it has on children, but the frequency it occurs. Loss is very common in the lives of children. The vast majority of children are going to experience the death of a close family member or a friend by the time they complete high school. Surveys have suggested it's somewhere around the order of 90%. We also know in the United States that 4 to 5% of children specifically experience the death of a parent by the time they reach 16. 
So it's highly likely that you're going to see a grieving child every day in your school, even if you don't see children who appear to be grieving. And although most children will adjust to even a major loss, that doesn't mean that they don't grieve, and it certainly doesn't mean that grieving isn't extremely difficult for them. At this point, I'm just going to uh, refer to a very brief clip. It's about uh, two minutes long. It'll give you a little bit of the voice of the children. And please remember to turn your speakers up. I think loss is something that's very hard to describe in words. I wasn't paying attention in class. A lot. And whenever they would ask me a question, I would be spaced out. Once or twice, I would bring up my dad. And everybody would be like, oh, do you want to talk about something else? A lot of people stayed away from me and didn't. Really talk to me a lot. A lot of my teachers actually do not Now many children in their families may not appear to be grieving and I'd like to like to start by talking about that um, and why that's the case. Well, many children and families may actually not even notify the school when their child has experienced a death. And many times again, the children won't, not only, not only won't they appear to be grieving, but they won't tell you that they've even experienced the loss. And part of that is that adults may unintentionally communicate to children that death is something that's just not openly discussed. So when a young child turns to a surviving family member um, right after they've been notified that a death has occurred and says something like that, I know that daddy is dead, but does that mean he won't be there for my birthday? The surviving family member often responds with tears, and kids are pretty egocentric, and they may actually conclude that they caused that person to cry by somehow misbehaving. Um, and so they may turn around and say, you know, say to say their mother, don't worry, mom, we're going to be okay. I know how to fix things around the house. I'll do everything daddy used to do. And then they actually turn around and support the parent who's actively grieving and give the false impression that they've actually fully adjusted to the loss or that it's had no impact on them. And similarly, if they talk about it in school, as some of the children said, people try and change the topic, or they, try, or they walk away, or they don't continue the conversation. And the children pick up the impression that talking about this is the wrong thing to do, so they don't talk about it. But there are many other reasons why children may not appear to be grieving. <clears throat> they may not yet understand the implications the loss has for them or for their families. When someone dies, we not only lose the person, but we also lose anything the person might do for us or might have done for us in the future. Or anything else that's associated with that individual may also be lost. So for example, if your brother dies, then that means that you don't see your brother's friends as much anymore and you lose those connections as well. Now, adults tend to think of these secondary losses. So I remember talking to one dad who had two young children after his wife died in an accident and he said he lived in fear of the day that his younger daughter um, developed her first period. But the issue was she was only about six or seven at the time, and it wasn't something she was worried about. Now, it may be something that she will um, experience the loss of her mom when that time comes in her life, but she wasn't thinking about that ahead of time the same way um, an adult does. So children may not yet understand all the implications for the loss. Or they may actually understand some of it and just feel too overwhelmed by their feelings. They don't want to talk about it because even if they went and talked privately with someone, they might feel that they're not going to be able to get their act back together and go back into class. Um, and that they might cry again later in the day if they start talking. So they may simply uh, not want to start the conversation. 
Children may also express their grief indirectly through their behavior or attempt to work their feelings out through their play. And children do this a lot with a range of feelings. And there are many games that actually have death as a central theme. One of the first games that children play that deals with the issue of death is peekaboo. It's actually played by children in all cultures around the world and starts in the second half of the first year of life. At this point, children start to develop what we call object permanence. They actually can remember people who are important to them and miss them when they aren't there. Two months old, we believe that when someone is out of sight, they're literally out of mind. They don't remember them, so they couldn't grieve them. But once they develop object permanence, they start to worry about permanent loss. And actually, that's when they start playing peekaboo. And in, in peekaboo, the infant uh, attaches their gaze to someone else. It might be someone they care about, but it could be a stranger as well. And then there's a separation as if the person has died. And then there's heightened awareness and concern, and then joy at reunion, and then they want to play it again. And they will do it over and over again because they're struggling to try and adjust to the concept that someone might actually disappear or die in their lives. Now, while this might seem far-fetched, Tikabu actually translates literally from Old English to alive or dead. And that's the game that children are playing. And the reason that they all play it, or children in cultures all across the world play it at the same point, is because they are starting to worry about the concept. So if you're talking to a child who's in school and somebody says to you, they're too young to talk about this, well, the reality is they've been talking about it since they were around six or seven months of age. It's just the adults are not the ones who seem ready uh, to carry on those conversations. Now, many adults will tell me that they don't think they know what to say, and they're afraid that they're going to upset children by bringing it up, or that they're just going to make things worse. Um, so they figure, if I don't know exactly what to say, it's probably best to say nothing. Well, saying nothing communicates a lot to children. It communicates that adults are either unconcerned, unaware, uncaring, or just unable to be of assistance. It leaves young children confused about what's happened. It leaves younger and older children unsupported. And it requires children of all ages to grieve alone. And that's not what we want to do. So what I thought I would do now is very briefly go over some of the wrong things to say. Uh, because if you know it's the wrong thing to say, then if you avoid that, you'll be able to say the correct thing. Here's an example of the wrong thing, a surgeon coming out and saying if it's any consolation, he seemed like a bit of a jerk. That would be the wrong thing to say. But most people would know that that's not an appropriate comment. But there are many things that we say that are well-intentioned when someone is grieving a recent loss that we might wish to reconsider. They're not necessarily wrong things to say. They're just things to be conscious of and to reconsider. And this, I should point out, is really when you are working with a child in a school setting. It is not, it's a very different situation when it's your own child or it's a relative, um, you know, some, your, your brother or sister's child. Um, and it is very different, obviously, when you're talking with peers. But in the situation of an acute loss, just think of yourself in the context as you're an adult who works in a setting and the whole experience is around the child's needs. The first is you don't want to try and cheer up survivors. I tell people anything that begins with at least is probably something you should reconsider. At least he's not in pain anymore. At least you still have another brother. Um, at least you were able to spend your birthday with him. These are um, attempts really by adults to try and get people who are grieving to stop looking upset. It doesn't actually make them feel better. Um, it just helps, it just communicates that you don't want to see their distress anymore. And that isn't helpful to the child who's grieving. You don't want to encourage children to be strong or to cover their emotions. And you should feel free to express your own feelings and to demonstrate empathy. A lot of times adults will tell me they're afraid they might get a little bit tearful or a little choked up or show a little emotion with children when they do talk about their losses. And I would say, you know what? That's actually a good thing. Children want to know that adults that are in their community care about them. And that's really how you create a supportive and caring school environment is by letting them know you care about them when something, when something bad has happened in their lives. Now, if it is a situation where you know, you're overwhelmed, perhaps you've had your own loss experience recently or you're afraid of um, someone dying in your family at that point in time, then you may not really be able to have a conversation without getting so choked up that you can't speak and that you're overwhelmed. 
Well, then I would ask someone else to talk to the child. That isn't something you should then volunteer for. But showing a little bit of motion and showing you care is perfectly all right. It isn't unprofessional. It's simply human. I would avoid statements such as, I know exactly what you're going through, because you really can't know what someone's going through unless you ask them. I wouldn't say something like, you must be angry, because you don't want to tell people how they ought to feel. You want to ask them how they actually are feeling. Statements like, both my parents died when I was your age, might be an attempt to show that you have empathy and concern, but it may actually appear to the child that you're trying to compete for sympathy. So if, if you share a personal loss experience with a child, then the child um, makes comparisons. And really, there's only two comparisons that can occur. Either the child will realize that your loss experience was greater than theirs. For example, they tell you that they had a friend who died, and you say, both my parents died when I was your age. And then the child has to turn around and try and provide comfort to you, to the adult. And we don't want to redirect the attention away from the grieving child. Or if you um, mention your loss experience and the individual thinks that it's insignificant compared to theirs, they may actually be insulted. I knew about one nurse who told a family that she understood what they were going through um, now that their infant had died because her dog had just died that weekend. And the parents were deeply insulted by that. So anytime you raise your own loss experience and share that with someone who's acutely grieving, you know, they've just found out about the loss or they're still trying to process it, um, I think it forms a comparison which isn't helpful. Um, so I would reconsider before you share your personal experience, certainly draw on that experience for insight and um, some sense of empathy and how to help, but I wouldn't uh, share that personal experience with the child. What you really want to do is allow the child and parents and others are present, the family, to be upset and just tolerate that they're upset, the unpleasant affect, without trying to change it. I would accept their reactions while suspending judgment. Don't try and figure out if it's normal or abnormal or what you would anticipate. Just observe it um, and allow them to have the re reaction. And intervene only when safety or health is a concern. So obviously, if a child indicates that they're going to hurt themselves or plan on hurting someone else, or you see a parent or an older student um, who has been drinking and you know they're going to get into a car, you, know, you intervene to, uh, in those situations because they're emergencies. But outside of those emergencies, I generally try and accept the, the reactions that the individual is having and just try and be present with them. I want to turn now to uh, some common reactions, and one of them is guilt. The thought processes of young children are limited in a number of ways. And one of them is what we refer to as egocentrism. Calvin explains it well. He says, I'm at peace with the world. I'm completely serene and hot death. Why is that? And he says, I've discovered my purpose in life. I know why I was put here and why everything exists. And Hobbes says, oh, really? And Calvin explains, yes, I'm here so everybody can do what I want. Now, Calvin's particularly perceptive because when Hobbes says it's nice to have that cleared up, he adds, once everyone accepts it, they'll be serene. Too. So that's the egocentrism of a young child. They assume that they are the center of the universe. Well, and they apply that same belief and same approach when they, when they are confronted with loss. So here Calvin says, don't die, little raccoon. It wouldn't be very grateful of you to break my heart. It's a very egocentric, kind of a self-centered perspective. And I will tell you that that's a very common perspective when someone has experienced um, a significant loss in their life or traumatic experience, they think about how it affects them. And I will tell you that that persists into adulthood. And you will see that in adults as well. Now, children, though, while they're egocentric, also have limited understanding of causality. They don't know why people die uh, or don't have as good an understanding of it. So if you don't know why it happened and you're egocentric, then the most logical conclusion is, well, I must have caused it. And that leads to the magical thinking that's often reinforced in children. Now, I raised my kids to believe in Santa Claus and have nothing against Santa Claus. But if you raise your kids to say that Santa is going to be aware if they do something kind to someone, you know, three weeks before Christmas, and is going to therefore instruct, you know, elves in, uh, to make a toy that's going to be exactly what you want and put it in a sled driven by reindeer, you know, the whole story unfolds. 
And if the child actually feels that all started because they said something nice to someone three weeks ago, well, then if they say something unkind to someone else and that person dies two weeks later, they're also going to assume that's their fault. So the magical thinking that we encourage in children makes them feel much more powerful than they are. And that's great when good things happen, but it's not so good when bad things happen. And it can result in guilt that's very difficult for children to um, feel is, you know, to, to get rid of or to feel that it wasn't their fault. I think Calvin makes a good point here. He calls for his mom and he says, a big dog knocked me down and he stole Hobbs. I tried to catch him, but I couldn't, and now I've lost my best friend. And his mother said as well, Calvin, if you wouldn't drag that tiger everywhere, things like this wouldn't happen. And he points out there's no problem so awful that you can't add some guilt to it and make it even worse. I've done bereavement work for over 30 years. Um, and I've found that um, rarely um, do I not find the guilt. I would say in 30 years there have been two or maybe three situations where I didn't find the guilt in the children or in the adults. In many situations, you know, I've gone when there have been major school shootings or other crisis events, and I will find teachers who feel guilty because they taught the student who was the shooter 10 years prior and were wondering if there was some mistake they made to not pick up that that child might have become a mass murderer. And it isn't logical um, for individuals to feel guilty in this way, but it is often how they do feel. Um, and we think at some level that individuals may, unconsciously at least, prefer to feel guilty than to recognize they actually had no role to play. Because if you feel guilty, then you're responsible, which means if you don't do the same thing again, then maybe you can make sure that this doesn't happen to someone else you care about. If instead you realize that you had no role to play, then you have to recognize that something like this could happen at any point, and it's actually completely out of your control. So guilt is a common reaction, and what I have taken, the, um, what I, the step that I always take is to reassure children and adults of their lack of responsibility. I will often say to people when something bad happens, we feel badly, and when we feel badly, we often wonder if there was something we did bad. Um, and then I reassure children that there was nothing they did, didn't do, should have done, or could have done that would have changed the outcome. But then I ask them if they ever felt that way, because I know that a lot of children tell me that they do. And that alone, that type of comment, is enough for children to often disclose some of their guilt feelings. Another thing that you will see in children, particularly in young children, is that their thought processes are rather concrete, and they tend to be pretty literal. Um, and as a result, they may, make con they may become confused over explanations that have been given to them. Here Calvin asks if the milk is spoiled, and his mom says, smell it and see. And he says, I'm not going to smell it, you smell it. And she just gets annoyed and says, oh, for goodness sake, here, it's fine. She doesn't ask why he's concerned. And then later he, off, off the cuff, just kind of says, I don't take chances with the product that prints the date she might expire. Now, while this is funny, and that's why it's used in a cartoon, the point is that that could be very frightening for a child. And so the point I would make is that religious explanations of death can be shared with children at any age, generally by their family, uh, but they shouldn't be the only explanation of death. They tend to be, um, the explanations tend to be more abstract, and therefore they're more likely to be misunderstood. So for example, I had one boy, he was about seven or eight years of age, and his brother had uh, died from sudden infant death syndrome. And his parents' explanation to him was that his brother was such a good little baby that God wanted him back at his side as an angel. Well, this boy then decided that whenever he went to church, which was God's home, he was going to make sure he didn't behave that well because he didn't want to be called back to be on his other side. So every time he was brought to church, he misbehaved as much as possible. Months went back, and he didn't even understand, the parents didn't even recognize this association until I had met them for something completely unrelated in a clinic visit and had asked more questions. And then they just looked at me and said, did we actually do that to our child? No, it wasn't that they didn't care about their child. It's just the explanation that they gave wasn't one that was actually helpful for him. So when you give explanations to children, try and keep, it, keep them as simple as possible. Avoid abstract explanations. And then check to make sure that they've understood it and let them know if they have other concerns that 
brief talk with you. Now there's a lot of material that you can uh, receive free of charge on how to support kids who are grieving. This is a booklet, After a Loved One Dies, How Children Grieve and How Parents and Other Adults Can Support Them. And you can go to the website for the coalition at grievingstudents.org and you can actually download this in a PDF file in English and in Spanish. We have versions in Chinese and Japanese as well at this point. Um, and you can also um, go to the link that says order free materials and you can order hard copies of this in either English or in Spanish. Um, and they can be sent in um, not only individual copies but also bulk copies that can be distributed in your school. And in fact the New York Life Foundation that supports this um, product um, will pay for the shipping and handling. And if you go to that uh, fulfillment page and when you click on the link order free materials, you'll find there are many other resources, all of them except one from Sesame Street, was developed by, our, by the coalition and the National Center for School Crisis and Bereavement and they're all free of charge. So I encourage you to take a look at the website <clears throat> and get some of these resources for your school. Now, I then want to turn to some other practical suggestions that you might uh, want to keep in mind when you're talking with children and families. Now, sometimes <clears throat> the school will be the only place where advice could be given about funeral attendance um, before the funeral has actually occurred when a child is involved. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that. I recommend that children at any age be invited to participate in funerals and other kind of commemorative and memorial activities that, that are being held by their families. Um, what you do is you explain to the child what occurs in the funeral in simple terms that the child can understand. Um, and it isn't just what happens to the body. It might also be that children may, be, children may see adults who are crying or that people may be telling stories that are funny and, and tell humorous remembrances of, some, of someone that's died. So you let them know what they're likely to see and experience and then ask their questions and then invite them to participate to the level they wish. I wouldn't force or coerce a child to do anything um, in a funeral or other type of commemorative activity, but instead I would invite them. And I think it is very useful if someone mentors the child through that experience, preferably someone who is not a close family member or friend who is grieving themselves. So that might actually be someone from the school, like an educational support professional. It could also be a neighbor. Um, it could also be um, you know, a music teacher or someone else that has a relationship with the child. And that way the child only has to participate to the level they wish. And if the person, the adult who is with them, notices that they're squirming or looks uncomfortable, they can ask to go out um, and get something from the car and then just ask the kid, do you want to go back in? Or maybe they just want to stand in the back of the room and hand out mask cards at the entrance, but not actually walk into or spend much more time in the funeral home itself. So by having someone mentor the child through the experience, I've never had a child regret having gone to a funeral in more than 30 years that I've worked with families. You also want to be aware of community resources and offer them to families, and you'll find links um, for the Moyer Foundation Resource Center um, on our web page, and that resource center can give you information about local resources for bereavement, whether they be children's bereavement groups or bereavement camps or hospice programs, so that you can find um, resources in your own community and then direct families to that um, so that they can get additional support. And of course, direct them to resources in your school, whether that's the guidance counselor, the social worker, the nurse, um, any of a number of people who also provide support in, in the school. And then you want to provide follow-up. Remember that grieving is a long-term process. It, you aren't over it in a year um, or in any particular period of time. And there may be situations where children will remember around the anniversary, around the time of the anniversary of the death, around the person's birthday, um, around Father's Day or Mother, Mother's Day if a parent died, or even around the holidays, Thanksgiving, for example, where we just have Memorial Day and families who have experienced a loss of a family member through military service will also find that to be a particularly difficult time. So what you want to do is, is touch back with kids um, and see how they're doing and, and let them know that you're still there to talk with them whenever they would like to. 
I also want to touch on, before I open this up to questions, about the importance of professional self-care. We need to recognize it's distressing to be with children who are in distress. You care about them, and therefore you don't like to see them upset. Um, and if someone's crying or upset, it's you know hard to feel like you're actually helping them, even when you are. So it's critical that staff find ways to have their own personal needs met and appreciate and address the impact of supporting children who are grieving or traumatized um, and the impact that's having on them personally and professionally. I remember talking to one superintendent at a conference. He stayed after I had spoken um, at a national conference. And he told me that he had had an accident in his school that involved a busload of children, and a number of the children were killed in the accident. This had happened a couple of years prior to when he was speaking to me. And he said that you know he was upset initially, um, but that even though a year or two had passed, he still found himself at times upset that the children had died. And he looked at me and he said, maybe I should retire because it still upsets me. And my comment to him was very clear. If you ever wake up as a superintendent and go to school and you don't care if the kids die, that's when you should retire. Caring about children is what we have to do. If we're going to do a good job of taking care of them, then we have to care about them, which means that it bothers us when they're upset as well. I remember talking to one teacher. Um, I was doing a professional development um, uh, program for their school, and I involved all the school staff, including the educational support professionals. But one of the teachers came up to me, and she said that school was starting on Monday morning, and it was now Friday afternoon, and she had been afraid to enter her classroom. She had not actually gone into the classroom that week to prepare the classroom uh, for the oncoming students, as all the other teachers had. And I asked her why, and she looked at me and she said, because if I prepare the classroom, then that means on Monday I'm going to come in and meet a new group of students. And if one of them dies, I don't think I can handle that. So she had seen some of the loss experiences of children and staff in the school over the past prior years, and she really wasn't sure she could form that type of relationship with students again. Now, we provided her support. I did a fair amount of in-service training. I talked with her. Um, and she ultimately did show up for school on Monday, went to the principal and said, I need to be in the classroom. I need to be with those kids. And she went and she did her job. But the issue is we have to recognize that it is not easy to watch children you know, grieving. And we need to create a culture in our schools. And you guys will all be the ones that do that, where it's okay at times to be upset when something upsetting happens and where everyone looks out for each other, normalizes asking for help, and models a willingness to accept assistance. We need to you know, have a, a climate where people help each other and see the important benefit um, and the role schools can play in supporting children in the aftermath of both crisis and loss. So I'm going to end just by telling you a little bit about some resources for you. As I had mentioned, um, the NEA is part of the Coalition to Support Grieving Students, and it involves uh, the NEA as well as the AFT, also for uh, principal, superintendent, um, and school administrator organizations, and organiz organizations representing school nurses, school psychologists, uh, school social workers, uh, and, school, um, and school counselors. In addition, we've started adding more supporting organizational members. And I have to say this slide only has a small percent of them. We've actually now gotten up to about 30 members in the Coalition to Support Grieving Students, and it involves a lot of national organizations. And the groups came together um, several years ago to create materials for free professional development on this topic. Created the website grievingstudents.org. It's a free website. It has over 20 video-based modules um, where you can get information about how to support grieving children in a range of different situations. Um, there's also additional resources that are print material. So you can go onto this website, watch a video that's 10 minutes or 15 minutes long, um, and then um, under, you know, print a summary of that as well. And it'll cover, you know, I'll go, I'll go over some of the topics that, that are covered on there, but it ranges from how to talk to children, what children understand at different ages, to dealing with situations like suicide, mass casualty events, um, crisis events in schools. So the last video clip that I'm going to show, which is just a minute and a half, um, talks a little bit about the impact on educators um, and other school professionals.
two years ago, I had a student come back from a funeral. And I, the kids... told me um, that his mother was in the hospital and that's why he hasn't been at school. I said, okay. So then when he came back, I said, Jonathan, he, he said, um, my mom passed. I had no idea. No one warned me, and I said, Jonathan, and I hugged him, and then I looked at him, and I was going to lose it at, because I, my heart, your mother, you know, and he looked at me, and he goes, Jackie, please don't. And I said, okay. So he didn't want to talk about it. And the only thing I let him know is, when you're ready, I'm here. And um, we're all here for you. And my door is all. Always open. And, you know. A so the teacher's comment, um, it shows you. Maybe three weeks later. And you can imagine how supportive that would be to a child who is grieving. Someone who just picks up on where the child is. And I like the metaphor, it's like a dance. I'm going to take the first step forward. If you're ready, we'll continue with the dance. Otherwise, we'll just stand together and listen to the music together. And that's, I think, what educational support professionals can do particularly well, is pick up the child, pick up where the child is at, and be present with them. And just being present with them and supportive is really, um, you know, an incredible help to children. It's not that I'm not expecting educational support professionals, or really for that matter, most professionals in schools, to provide bereavement counseling to children. There are some counselors and mental health professionals. But the rest I'm not expecting to provide counseling. I'm just expecting them to provide support. And a lot of what I've talked about is just how how to provide that support. And I would say that educational support prof professionals, by the climate that they um, establish within schools, can play a big role in doing just that. So I'm going to, in about two minutes, just go over some of the other resources. There are other guidance documents, articles, and other uh, resources that you'll find on the website. But I did want to mention that the National Center for School Crisis and Bereavement is available to serve as a resource for information, training materials, consultation, and technical assistance. We have a website, schoolcrisiscenter.org, which has a range of materials. For example, we recently posted something around Memorial Day and how to help kids around Memorial Day, but we also posted materials after the bombing that happened um, in Manchester about how to support kids in situations of terrorism. And if you want further information, you can call our toll-free number for the center or go to schoolcrisiscenter.org, um, and you can also post comments. Um, I'm just going to mention that this is a Gordimer Gibbons Life on Normal Street. There's a link that was added to the website, and I had done some consultation with the creative team on this children's television show, which is on Amazon Prime. And um, in that show, they decided to have one of the characters experience the sudden death of her mother. And I worked with the creative team so that they actually talked about this and addressed this throughout the remainder of the series. And they not only showed accurately how children grieve, but they demonstrated ways to support children over time by other adults, by surviving parents, um, and, and by the peers as well. So I thought they did a very nice job. One of the shows um, 
one of the segments actually uh, won the Screenwriters Guild Award for a children's television show about a year ago. So I, this clip is just a, a brief, I think it's about two minute long video clip that is not only an interview of me, but it actually shows some clips from the show um, and how the actors portrayed some of those approaches. So at this point, what I'd like to do is open it up to questions and comments. Um, and I can also get into the chat box. So the first one was, is it okay to say that the, that the deceased person went to heaven instead of saying that they died? Well, um, usually in school settings, uh, if they're public school settings, it's probably preferable not to bring up certain religious belief systems because there are some families who don't use the concept of heaven and don't believe that there is an afterlife after people have died. Um, so that's, I think, one issue to keep in mind. But perhaps even more importantly, if you people will say, well, I don't want to use the word die or dead because that seems rather harsh and might be upsetting. The reality is the only reason it's upsetting is because they understand what's happened. And that's why you want to use the words. They're not upset by the words. They're upset about what's occurred. And if we use the words that are unclear, chances are they won't really understand what you've said. It increases the opportunities for misconceptions and misinterpretations. So it really actually is important that you say to children that someone has died um, at least once until you're sure that they understand what's occurred. Then the question was, what do we do um, in ongoing grief? What about if, there's, if the children live with a family member who is dying or has a serious, potentially life-limiting condition? Actually, one of the video modules is exactly on that. What to do if there is a family member who has a potentially life-limiting condition or there's a student or a teacher or other school professional um, who similarly has a potentially life-limiting condition? What I express to people is kind of the main points I would say is that you're really trying to help children understand that someone is seriously ill and that they may not get better. And that is why people are concerned about them. Um, you don't need to predict that they're going to die or suggest to children that they're going to die soon. Um, to be quite honest, soon for very young children might mean before their next meal. And so you want to make sure that you let them know that there's something serious going on and that you are concerned um, because I think that gives them the opportunity to ask questions and then ask them you know, what other questions they have and what other explanations would be useful to them. But I do think you want to be honest and direct with children. But if someone has a serious illness, you don't necessarily have to bring up the fact that they are likely to die from it because you really can't predict what is going to kill someone or what they might die from. Next one had to do uh, with whether or not it was uh, a good idea to say that a past loved one is now an angel. Well, I think that, um, again, I think those are issues that, have, that are really aligned or not aligned with the family's religious and cultural beliefs. And so that's probably something that's going to be shared by a member of the family or someone in that faith organization. Now, of course, if you work in a school that is a religious school, then um, that's a very different situation. And then you may be saying things that are, you know, the type of things that fit with the belief system of that religion. But assuming that you're in a public school setting or another setting where it's, it, there isn't a particular shared religious belief, I again might comment about saying that someone is an angel would be very similar to saying that they've gone to heaven. Now, one of the challenging things is when you tell very young children that um, someone has gone to heaven, then they may actually be concerned that that person is somehow, you know, still cold, still hungry, um, still scared, still in pain. They may not understand that all life functions cease when somebody dies. Um, and if you tell them that they continue to live in heaven, it can get confusing and sometimes even upsetting. A lot of times when people say to, to young children that their body goes to heaven or the person goes to heaven, they will ask, why do you put them in the ground if they're going to go to heaven, if heaven is up in the sky? And then that means that they have to figure out how that happens. Kids generally come up with two types of explanations. One, that um, people dig themselves out of their grave, but they are ghosts and they can't be seen, and that's kind of scary or that it happens while they're asleep in the middle of the night, 
which, and that's why they don't see it, and that's also scary. But that isn't necessarily reassuring to children. So when I am explaining heaven um, to children, if that fits with the belief system of the family, um, the type of explanation that I might use just to model some of the language would be when someone dies, their body doesn't work anymore. And that means it doesn't hurt, it isn't hungry, um, it, doesn't, um, you know, it doesn't move anymore, and it doesn't feel pain anymore. And that's why we can put the body into the ground and bury it. Um, but some people believe that a special part of that person that they call their spirit or their soul continues even after they have died. And people believe, or some people believe, that that happens in a place called heaven. So you don't, you want to, you can express what heaven means um, to individuals who believe in it. Um, and sometimes that's quite useful with kids. But I would avoid saying that the person continues to live after they've died because that's confusing to kids. And I also tell them that when someone has died and goes to heaven, if their soul continues on in heaven or their spirit, once someone has died, they never come back to life again, so we never know for sure what it looks like or where it is. And that people need to believe it is, uh, we believe it occurs uh, based on our faith. So then the question was about offering, the next question was about offering group counseling to high school students that have lost a fellow student to an, um, because they may have, um, they may be more comfortable talking in group settings. And yes, that can happen not just in high schools, but also in middle schools and elementary schools. I know someone in the comments posted something about banana splits and that that, um, I know that there was a banana splits that um, was in my, uh, one of my daughter's schools, her elementary school, that was for children whose parents were divorced or separated. And I actually found out that she was going to the group for a number of months. Um, I asked her why, if she had concerns about, um, you know, her, her mom and me and our relationship, and she did not. But it actually turned out that she was going because one of her good friends, uh, her parents had separated, and she didn't feel that the girl would go without her. So she went along with her. Um, and it turned out she was going for months. We didn't realize that. She was concerned that if she stopped going, that the girl wouldn't go. So she accompanied her over lunchtime uh, for a matter of a couple months. She also told me they served brownies, and she liked the brownies, but she assured me that wasn't the reason. Now, there may be school professionals, uh, school mental health professionals in your school that can set up some of these bereavement support groups. And I often find that bereavement centers around the country often offer this as a free service to come to the school and set up these groups. Then there was a question about um, are there resources for helping a student whose parent has died and is trying to figure out what their relationship with the new step-parent should look like? Well, I think anyone that provides bereavement support and, and counseling, whether that's in the school or outside of the, outside of the school, will often address these issues as they come up. And, you know, blended families in trying to figure out how to establish a relationship with a step-parent um, when your other parent is either still alive or has died is very complicated or can be complicated. And unfortunately, a lot of what we see um, in stories that are geared to children don't present this very well. So not to be highly critical, I remember going to see Snow White with my daughter when she was very young. She was about four years old and she was sitting in my lab. And I think it's a perfect example of really how not to explain blended families to children. So if you, you know the story, uh, I mean, in this situation, um, the child's mother dies, the father remarries another woman. Um, she becomes jealous of the girl because of her beauty and decides that what she needs to do is murder her. And she wants her heart cut out and presented to her as evidence. So the girl does not cope effectively with this. She doesn't turn to her dad for support or other family members or, or an educational support professional at school. Instead, she runs into the woods and lives on her own and gets pursued. Um, and then her stepmother turns herself into what she describes as an ug ugly old hag, because we have a lot of concerns in our country about beauty and a lot of fears of the, and, and lack of respect for the elderly. And so she then tries to give her, um, a, you know, a magic apple. Um, so she's taken an apple, I, it could have been you know, a cupcake or a cookie, but instead it's an apple, and she's made it frightening by giving it magical powers, 
And then I heard, you know, the character say, and what will happen is Snow White will eat this, um, and it's not that she dies. She instead falls into an everlasting sleep, and then the dwarfs, thinking that she is dead, will bury her alive. And when that line was said, I just turned to my daughter, whispered in her ear, and I said, you know we do not bury people when they're asleep. We know when people have died. And she just said to me in a loud whisper, it's only make-believe, Dad. Of course I know that. But the issue is that is confusing and frightening to children. And then what happens in the story is that the dwarfs, deciding that she's so beautiful even in death, don't bury her and instead place her in a glass coffin and watch her in death. And then some stranger comes by who happens to be a prince, sees that she is so beautiful even in death, opens the coffin and kisses her, and she wakes up and decides to marry this man, even though that would be in, is a bizarre behavior to open a coffin and kiss a stranger who you think is beautiful. So if you think about that's the story that a lot of kids hear at young ages. And so they do not hear um, good, often they do not see good examples of blended families in a lot of these stories that are geared to young children. And there's also a lot of misinformation. And so these are things that you can help kids with because I assure you, you will do a much better job in how to support a kid um, who's experienced a loss than in that situation. And in terms of uh, resources for children with limited language, such as autism, um, that is an area we need to develop some more resources on. But uh, what I will tell you is that my basic recommendation is that children with disabilities, um, you actually aim your explanations at their developmental level instead of their chronologic level. In other words, if they're seven years of age, but they're functioning more like a three or four year old in terms of their understanding or of their language, then you gear your explanations for a child of that younger age. Now, children with autism in particular sometimes don't have the ability to directly communicate their distress. I remember seeing one uh, child or hearing about one child who um, his mother had died and he had severe autism and very limited language ability. And it turned out that he started hitting his head, started banging his head more. And he got worked up for ear infections and possible brain tumors. And finally, when he was in the um, hospital and he was being hospitalized for the evaluation, someone noticed that when they mentioned his mother, that's when it became worse. So this, the situation is that children will grieve the loss of someone that they care about and are connected to and that they may not always be able to communicate them. And then the last question I see here is what other grief trainings are available to us as ESP to better help school counselors? Um, and I think that really what you want to do is go and talk with people in your school to find out what is available. But as I mentioned, at least according to the educators, only 3% of schools offer training in this area. Um, so it's probably a good chance that it's not there yet, and you can serve as wonderful advocates. Let them know about the materials on the Coalition website. There are actually our downloadable lectures uh, that can be used, PowerPoint presentations with embedded speaker notes and links. Um, all of the videos are available for, for use as well. And so I would encourage you to let the school know about these resources, and not only as NEA a member of the Coalition, but so are a vast majority of the professional organizations in schools, including the ones for school principals. So go to them and let them know about the resources, and chances are it's already been endorsed by the organization that they belong to as well. So I'm going to stop there and see if there are any other questions that, that uh, people have. I want to thank you all for taking the time to do this. It, it shows me even more uh, what I already knew that educational support professionals are committed in very important ways to helping kids uh, through their school climate. And I want to thank you all for taking the time to do this. It, it shows me even more uh, what I already knew, that educational support professionals are committed in very important ways to helping kids uh, through their school climate and, and working directly with students. I remember doing one training and having um, one of the cafeteria workers walk up to me and said this was the first time that I had been invited to a professional development in this school, and I've been here for, I think, 20 or 25 years. She said, thank you for recognizing that support professionals can provide support to children. And so I think it's something I already knew, 
Um, but, and I'm sure you all know it as well, just hope we can make sure that others rec uh, recognize how important a role you can play in this and other areas. So thank you for the work that you're doing. Well, thank you, Dr. Schoenfeld, for that enlightening presentation on the role ESP play in supporting grieving students and positively impacting school climate. Um, we can definitely see from your presentation how um, it really does take the whole um, school and community to educate the whole student and to support the whole student. Um, I saw thank you again for your participation on behalf of the Center for Great Public Schools, uh, NEA's ESP Quality Department. Um, we hope that you enjoyed this session, and we look forward to your participation in future NEA webinars. Again, please uh, remember to visit www.nea.org forward slash ESPPD to stay up to date with both the recordings of uh, past webinars as well as upcoming webinar sessions. Thank you, and have a good evening.